Remember the story of Goldilocks? Not too hot, not too cold, everything just right? That's what we have here on planet Earth. But what keeps it that way? And what could cause the climate to rapidly shift? And mostly, what happens when sunlight gets in, but the heat can't get out? Scientists now understand just how close we might be to finding out. The hard way. Stockholm, Sweden, 1895. Chemist Svante August Arrhenius calculates that gases produced by smokestack industries could dramatically warm the air. The temperature of the Arctic regions would rise about 8 or 9 degrees Celsius if carbonic acid increased 2.5 to 3 times. Carbonic acid is carbon dioxide, CO2, and it rose much more quickly during the 20th century than Arrhenius guessed partly because of humanity's obsession with the internal combustion engine. Now, Earth has not warmed as much as Arrhenius predicted, but the science Arrhenius set in motion is poised to impact human society. As much as Einstein's work on the atom. Many climate scientists are now strongly suggesting Civilization really needs to go on a low-carbon diet. It's time to rethink the relationship between our machines and the sun. Because methane, CO2, and a few other industrial gases trap heat in roughly the same way as a greenhouse. The transparent air lets most sunlight through. About 30% is bounced back into space by the atmosphere itself, Earth's surface, clouds, and particles in the air. Bright snow reflects. Ocean and land mostly absorb. And the sun-warmed Earth, in scientific terms, shifts the visible and near-infrared radiation to mid-infrared thermal radiation. But greenhouse gases grab that thermal radiation, echo some of it back down to the ground, and the heat gets trapped. The precise scientific situation is also made cloudy by, well, clouds. Thick, low-hanging clouds reflect sunlight back into the cosmos. But thin clouds high up can actually warm the Earth by trapping heat, just like a greenhouse gas. Push the greenhouse temperature up to the point where there isn't enough liquid water to bind carbon back into the surface rocks, and you get the planet Venus. It's a greenhouse disaster, 900 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. Your frozen waffle will be burned to a cinder in under 10 seconds. But Venus should only be about 200 degrees in that orbit. Mars, our neighbor on the other side, has an opposite problem. Mars needs a stronger greenhouse to warm it up. Venus and Mars atmospheres are both mostly carbon dioxide, but at way different densities. On Venus, your barometer would read a pressure nearly 90 times higher than on Earth, while on Mars, it'd be 150 times lower. Now, Earth's atmosphere is very different stuff. More than three-quarters nitrogen and about one-fifth oxygen. What put the oxygen here? Life itself did. And life thrives here precisely because of Earth's natural greenhouse effect. At Earth's distance from the sun, our planet should be nearly 100 degrees colder, our oceans frozen solid. And in those oceans, trillions of tiny guys like this, phytoplankton, who gobble up CO2, and in return, produce a lot of the world's oxygen. And in the last few years, they've been blooming in record numbers in the warmer waters along the coastlines. Phytoplankton seem to be a natural mechanism counteracting greenhouse warming. Volcanoes have been making greenhouse gases for most of Earth's history. Hawaii's Kilauea alone pumps out the carbon equivalent of 132,000 sport utility vehicles each year. But volcanic smoke and aerosol droplets can also block the sun's heat and cool our world. 
Through many interactive processes like these, Earth has managed to become the Goldilocks planet of the solar system. But the emerging scientific consensus is that it's a very delicate balance. Arrhenius, it seems, had it right more than a century ago. How we, the machine makers of Earth, manage our relationship with the Sun will determine if we're allowed to stay here in paradise or be thrown out of the Goldilocks zone and into the runaway greenhouse.